good afternoon everyone i am prateek gupta a first year student at the full time mba program at ucla anderson welcome to today's event if you have ever traveled by air chances are that you have flown on a plane that was made in one of our dean's distinguished speakers factories today i have the honor of introducing a true visionary in the aerospace industry dr tom anders ceo of airbus group Dr. Tom Anders studied economics, political science, and history at the University of California and the University of Bonn. Prior to joining the aerospace industry, Dr. Anders served as a major in the German Army Reserve. His foray into the business world began in 1991 when he joined the marketing department of Daimler Chrysler Aerospace. In 2012, he was appointed as the chief executive officer of the Airbus Group after having served as co-CEO for five years. Since 2011, Dr. Anders served in the business advisory group of UK Prime Minister James Cameron, and has been a member of the Joint Advisory Council of the Alliance Group since 2013. Armed with a helicopter pilot license and a passion for skydiving, he performed a para drop from the most advanced military aircraft, the Airbus A400M Atlas. It is also my pleasure to welcome Dean Judy Olian, who you should all know by now. and who will be leading the discussion today <laughs> ladies and gentlemen dean judy olian and the ceo of airbus group dr tom anders uh thank you prateek for that uh warm introduction and let me welcome uh dr tom anders i'm going to call him tom it's been a while since you've been back on campus and you wandered around today do you want to tell us about your past experience when you were first here Yeah, I was here. By the way, I was not a regular student. I have to correct this. I was here um, '81, fall '81, until uh, spring, summer '82. And what I did was, um, at the time, I was very much interested in military strategy and particularly nuclear strategy, armament and and disarmament. And there was a, the time, a great center here in up in Bunch Hall, the Center for International Strategic Affairs, CESAR. under Roman Kolkovitz and Bill Potter and on the other hand I knew some people in Rand Corporation who were helping me with some of the stuff so it was a great time but but you you always say I'm not sure it qualifies serious study I had a lot of fun I was at that time already uh, very much addicted to skydiving and the weekends I usually spend in in Paris Valley uh skydiving and in the, in the during the week I uh because my budget was very small i was eating the uh the oatmeal at the uh, the cafeteria at that time i don't know what it costs now but 50 cents that was affordable so that i could save some money for the skydiving in the <laughs> in the weekend so we take students for all kinds of reasons at UCLA uh <laughs> well it's 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 really um uh, wonderful i i i met tom when we were in toulouse at the headquarters of of Airbus and I want to take you through a few questions that illuminate Airbus's business and your strategic thinking. And of course one recent big move of Airbus is locating a plant in Mobile, Alabama. So take us through the strategic considerations of a company that's really a, a consortium of various aeronautical companies from Germany, France, Spain, the UK coming to Mobile, Alabama. Mm. Well, yes, uh, with pleasure. I mean, in a nutshell, the US is the largest aeronautic and space market of the world. The second largest is now China. We have a production facility in in Tianjin, China, and uh, we thought that it was a good thing to be firmly moored in America as as well. Um for various reasons, but also quite quite openly to be uh to be more seen as also an american uh, company and i have to say we get great support in alabama but also in the uh, adjacent states like like mississippi like florida um, and so on and it all started with a, a great partnership with a man who's sitting here in the first uh, row ron sugar at the time the ceo of of northrop grumman i'm happy ron is is here today uh, because we were originally considering mobile alabama as the production plant for our joint tanker uh, the final assembly of the tanker would have happened in mobile ron we fought hard uh we won it huh we won yes and then it was 
mysteriously taken away from us and uh, finally we lost it and then we scratched our head and said, gee, we have invested so much, I mean not so much, uh, not in money terms, but in relationship terms and that matters a lot for me in business. We had this great support down there in Alabama by the governor, by the congressman, the senators, bipartisan support, the mayor of, of Mobile stood by us throughout all these years, supported us also on other, other topics and said, this is a great investment. I mean, this was second to none, I have to say, I haven't seen that in Europe, such a strong support, and what can we do there? And, um, well, actually it had been sitting right in front of us all the time. The U.S. is the largest, what we call the single aisle aircraft market, i.e. the uh, A320 family, 737 family, these are the, the short range or regional aircraft, and uh, is that to have that there in Alabama will not be a bad thing for our sales. Why? Well, we followed basically the experience of the car industry. The European car industry experienced that they could get that far in the American market, 20% perhaps, etc. but then there was kind of a glass ceiling. They couldn't get through this unless they would come to America and produce great cars also in America. That worked for Mercedes, that worked for BMW, and quite, quite uh, some others as well, Japanese car makers. And we looked at that and said that might be applicable also to the um, aeronautic industry. So uh, last week we have, or week before, we have delivered our first aircraft to JetBlue out of Mobile, Alabama. Great, great quality. Half of the workforce are veterans, very motivated uh, people. And I'm sure that plant will be one of the major facilities for our production of commercial aircraft going forward. And uh, unlike, let's say, BMW and Mercedes, I mean, the, the kinds of contracts you have, especially on the defense front, require you to win also in the court of public opinion in, in the hallways of Washington. Was, was that a big factor? Was currency a factor? Well, currency was less effective. I would say this was typically a strategic decision, not one. Of course, you could, you know, construe a business case, um, but that was not really the thing. I mean, that was looking into the future and say, as a company that is very international already today, as a company that wants to, if anything, um, improve its successes in the major markets, the U.S. included, it can't be wrong to be producing in America. By the way, I mean, we are the largest single customer, uh, foreign customer of U.S. aerospace products in the world. We buy more than 12, 13 billion U.S. dollar worth of equipment in America every year. But you don't get much credit for that because uh, the other guys do as well. Um, and, uh, and a plant like Mobile, um, Mississippi is far more visible. And, and so it's basically uh, complementary. And as far as defense is concerned, yes. I mean, sure enough, defense is still very national, no different in, in Europe than, than over here. Uh, my experience, Ron, with the tanker, don't even think about it to try to sell something to the US military if you do not clearly have a product that is, is better than what the competition can, can offer. And even that is not always uh, enough. Good enough. Enough, yes. Uh, uh, by the way, some of you may recognize the questions that you yourselves asked because a lot of the questions here are <coughs> from our students and uh, our, our faculty, so thank you for that. And I'll stop somewhere along the way and turn to you uh, with the microphones for you to ask questions. Um, so, so one of your priorities has been the digitalization of, of Airbus. How uh, is technology impacting the nature of um, flying and therefore the nature of the products that you're developing? AI, uh, big data analytics, uh, how is it affecting navigation systems, uh, equipment diagnostics, etc.? cetera? Well, good question, Judy. Uh, first of all, I mean, digitalization, uh, that's nothing original for us, right? I mean, everybody is doing that. The whole industry um, is um, gearing up uh, towards that. The whole aerospace industry is thinking how to make uh, best use of it. So this is uh, nothing where I would say um, we're leading. But I think in aerospace, we, we understand more and more 
that the, the combination of um, what is digitalization? I mean, new tools, um, uh, new processes, very much based on, on data exploitation at, uh, at, at a scale that was hitherto or only a few years ago unimaginable, that the combination of these tools and the um, kind of um, innate innovative power of aerospace should probably, I, I believe, um, um, will get us into a situation where aerospace will again be more innovative. If you look back um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, where we had, we made huge progress in a, in a few years, and people were, from that, they were extrapolating where will we be at the end of a, of a century, and a lot of people were seriously believing, I mean, after, the, after setting foot on on the moon, we will be out of a solar system already in the year 2000. Somehow, uh, that dip didn't happen, and a lot of reasons why it didn't happen. Um, so I think that digitalization and aerospace combined, smartly combined, can lead to a, a new push of innovation in the field of aeronautics and, and space, and I, I think we see quite some proof of that in, uh, in, in quite, a, quite a few areas. And, and so, um, yes, we are embracing this. Uh, we have, um, um, look, I mean, Europe sometimes has the problem of, of talking endlessly about concepts, particularly the Germans love it, the so-called Gesamtkonzept. We need a comprehensive concept before we can do anything, and we need to think about regulation first. That's also a European specialty, other than the United <laughs> States. Before we come up with a new technology, we need to regulate it. Um, we decided last year, we do it. We, we try, we may fail, we, we make experience. I have to say in the last 12 months, we've done a lot of uh, um, pilot projects with data analytics in the industry. Um, and that is very promising because the aerospace industry is an incredibly data-rich industry. I mean, we, we figured the other day that we probably currently, and that's, I think, not specific to Airbus, only, only use less than 0.1% of the data that we're generating uh, with our test aircraft, but also with customer aircraft, et cetera. And, um, and I clearly see a, a lot of potential here. Um, our, our colleagues at Boeing uh, talk about breaking the cost curve. Uh, same thing. I mean, we need to get away from development times of all new aircraft that are usually seven, eight years, commercial aircraft. Military aircraft take us uh, quite often even, even oh, longer. Yeah. And, and, and uh, bills for, for development costs of uh, something like 15 billion, and usually a couple of billions more because we are, uh, we have, we've been over-optimistic with our uh, cost targets. Uh, and that we need to get away with. And breaking that cost curve, for instance, through digitalization, uh, imagine what the industry would look like if we could do a big new aircraft program instead of eight years in four years. Imagine what would that mean in terms of cost and, and eventually shareholder value, but also in terms of money for new innovations. And, and that's something that uh, data analytics and smart digitalization at least holds a strong promise, I think. Uh, people talk about smart engines, for example, and that being ma uh, the maintenance of that through AI from a distance, etc. Right. So there are a lot of innovations that yeah. could really impact uh, all facets of the industry. Yes, I mean, this is, this is for instance, uh, yeah, the engine makers are doing that, putting, right. putting lots of sensors on the engines, right. predictive maintenance. Exactly. Yeah, to do, to do uh, maintenance of an engine before it breaks down, right. or before the, the cycle, or even fly it longer, because you can, you can demonstrate that the health of the uh, engine is very good. We did, for instance, a, a pilot project with an, um, uh, with an airline that has uh, 200 uh, Airbus aircraft, and the, the target was to improve the operational availability of the fleet because you right. always have you know some 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 aircraft that break down need right. to be repaired etc we looked at the the partner with whom we did that looked at each and every aircraft um, and and um, you know built a a cv a specific cv for this aircraft and and for the systems not just for, for the aircraft and with that we were able to enhance the operational availability of the fleet by something like 20 percent i think uh, and it's amazing because what you did was, 
okay, um, the healthy aircraft you put on what we call thin routes where you have less logistic support, less spares if something breaks down. Uh, let's say out to Reykjavik from, from uh, Copenhagen or whatever. Um, and the less healthy aircraft you put on those routes where you have good logistics, good spare support so that the aircraft, if it breaks down, if it has a problem, gets repaired very quickly. And by that alone you could... So there's a lot of potential, I think, in the, in the aerospace industry, what you can do with big data and data analytics. So you've just said something that was music to the ears of our faculty in operations research who, who look at, at these kinds of questions. They also look at backlog issues. So Airbus has the largest backlog in the industry, uh, 10 years worth, almost 7,000 aircraft on order, a trillion dollars worth of aircraft. So the question is why and how you would manage that. And, and a lot of times it's this notion of volatility in, in the demand curve that we're not quite sure yeah. people, but of course there are some drivers that are now much more stable in your demand curve replacement. So why do you have such a backlog? Are you going to keep it at that? Are you going to increase production? And what's optimal? Well, I guess we have this backlog because um, people want those planes. People, people love our planes, and people <laughs> need planes. Um, but I should say, <clears throat> these are not just lofty um, MOUs or uh, letters of intent or so. We count as backlog only those aircraft where the customers uh, pay us so-called pre-delivery payments. So they have to put their money where their mouth is, so to say, and uh, that's important. So these pre-delivery payments until the final delivery of an aircraft obviously run from, from signature of the purchase agreement over, I don't know, three, four, five years until delivery of the aircraft. So that's a serious backlog. Nevertheless, it can happen that in crisis this backlog melts down. <coughs> we had a um, very interesting experience if you can imagine, back in 2008-09, <coughs> with the post-Lehman crisis. Um, and we lost, reshuffled, uh, delayed deliveries of more than 600 aircraft in, in less than uh, uh, one and a half years. And while doing that, we still kept production steady and ramped it, ramped it up then again. A huge backlog makes you more robust or resilient in crisis. So that is what it does. I mean, there's always customers who, particularly airlines, right? I mean, they, they come into existence and they perish again. And some of them will not live long enough to take the, the aircraft that they have ordered. Um, but then there are others who are happy to take delivery slots, these earlier delivery slots from, from somebody else. So this backlog management makes us much more robust uh, and, uh, and resilient, and it works. And we overbook our uh, deliveries as well in a, in a given year, uh, like airlines do. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. some of us have probably had this uh, unfortunate experience. You come to the counter and they say, I'm sorry, your, your, your seat is already taken by, by somebody else because they overbooked it. Um, so we do overbooking. Overbooking plus this huge backlog gives us uh, robustness in terms of crisis. It doesn't make us invulnerable, and I should say this this backlog is not evenly spread over the whole um, product uh, portfolio. So most of these, almost 7,000, more than 5,000, are in the single aisle area. These are the 320 family uh, aircraft that are in, in very high demand. And these are the ones that we overbook also because we know there's plenty of customers. And, and there, there wouldn't be a point where you'd say, OK, this is very much stable demand. We're going to increase capacity. Oh, we do increase capacity. I mean, it's. Uh, it's, it's, we are currently at, at a capacity uh, annual, annual output of six to 700 uh, large uh, commercial aircraft. And, um, this, is, this is no small feat because you have, a, you have to have a supply chain that is responsive, that is ready and, and mature. Um, we usually give a supply chain a couple of years to prepare when we make an announcement that we're ramping up. We're currently at 42, 44 um, single aisle aircraft per month out of the uh, production sites in Toulouse, in Hamburg, in Tianjin, and now also in, in Mobile. And we want to go up to 60 per month in the year 2019. So that's a huge effort, but the demand is there. I mean, at some point it stops when you tell people, 
uh, okay, we can sell you an aircraft, but it takes five it. years to, yeah. to deliver it. Which airline wants to make that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of bet? So we're ramping up capacity, but at Airbus, we've always done it in a, in a more stable and prepared way, i.e. we're not chasing peaks. Um, uh, because, first of all, we don't have fire and fire in Europe. We, can, we, we, we don't have the fle same flexibility in the workforce that people have over here. Um, and, and secondly, to give the supply chain time to uh, accommodate and prepare appropriately for the, for the production rise. By the way, uh, I'm, I'm getting a couple of questions, a few questions here on Twitter. Feel free to use the Twitter hashtag here and send me questions and I'll certainly incorporate them. Um, you, uh, but by the way, so before we leave this uh, subject, um, understand we have some, some academic experts here. So if there's um, any advice, I mean, we learn, <laughs> we learn by doing. It's a little bit trial and error. We have our experience now, but we are certainly not perfect. So if there's some, some advice from the academic side, what we could do better, that would be perfect. I'm sure there'll be some takers, actually. Okay. This is a classic problem. So we have a question here about disruption in your business. Uh, what innovations could disrupt the business? We have SpaceX. We have Blue Origin. Um, could it be Google, Amazon? Where do you look, uh, to, uh, not with paranoia, but with um, healthy regard for competition? Well, it's a very interesting question. I'd say until a few years ago, we were talking about uh, disruption and new com competition. We were um, solely looking at when is China coming up, what are the Indians doing, and the Russians are having a new program and, and stuff like that, apart from following our main competitors uh, here in the, in the United States. And, and, and then I think SpaceX indeed was kind of a wake-up call. You say, well, you know, these guys started in 2004. We didn't take them serious until only a few uh, years ago. The typical arrogance of an incumbent, uh, I should say. Um, and I realized there are other companies. Um, so isn't it possible, perhaps, that the, the Internet companies have taken increasing interest in that? Uh, Google has a division today that's called Google Wings. They are working on unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, uh, Facebook is interested in, in satellites and, and, and stuff and stuff like that. Amazon primarily today to Amazon. Amazon, prim primarily I would say to uh, to ensure better internet access and access to the services. But out of that um, could come more. I realize that in the Silicon Valley, when you speak to major investors, they say that the, the new big wave is transportation. Um, and the question, as you all know, how many new um, automotive companies will America have in a couple of, couple of years, in addition to the well-known ones, or maybe some of them are disappearing, what, whatever. But transportation will not stop with ground transportation. It's increasingly the question, can't we use airspace much more efficiently? You know, just look at all these clocked highways, the traffic jams there, etc. What if we had more individual air transport or small um, bus transport through the air, and I think there's a lot of activity going on, not only you in Silicon Valley. You might talk about the Uber helicopter partnership. Yeah, yeah, that is more, uh, Judy, that is more different business model, right? And you say, okay, what Uber is doing on the road, uh, that should be doable also for, for, for air transportation. And can we combine the two? You know, you, you get, you get brought to a, to a helipad, and then from there you take you take a helicopter, and then the last mile again, there's uh, ground you're, transport. You're piloting this already. Hmm? You piloted that. Not in with few... Uber. No, that would be that would be too dangerous no, for no, Uber. No, 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 <laughs> you, you, no. You, you tested it, I think, in, yeah, yeah. in, in we, various... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, we I tested it. We will, we'll soon test it in, in Sao Paulo, which is probably the city with the highest uh, helicopter yeah. traffic uh, in, in the world. You did it at Sundance, yeah. I think, here. Yeah. yeah, Sundance here. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, but yeah, this is not necessarily always about technology, it's about business new models. business models as well. Yeah. <coughs> um, but speaking about technology, you had a pretty interesting weekend uh, with uh, what, what, you, what is called the Perlin Glider, a new, um, a new, a new plane uh, that, that you developed at Airbus. We have a couple of pictures here, if we can 
see them. There we go. That's the Perlin glider. Well, what's special, if you, if you look at the, the nose, um, what's special about this one is this is a pressurized glider because we want to take it up to 90,000 feet. 90,000 feet. And uh, that is in these big mountain waves that sometimes occur here in the Sierras. But you don't get to 90,000 feet, feet here. But in Argentina, it should be, it should be possible. And this is engineless. This is engineless, absolutely. So 90,000 feet without yeah. an engine. Yeah. But it's so not what we've done it last weekend. By the, way, by the way, the weather in Nevada was lousy. I mean, we, we just had a little um, window where we could bring it up to so a few so thousand so feet. So, yeah. so there's Dr. Yeah, Enders is, there. Yeah. Uh, piloting the, the glider. It looks a little bit more in a, like a submarine than in a... a, a <laughs> yeah, it couldn't have been comfortable. It was pretty comfortable, except that the visibility, I mean, what, what, what you know from gliders, you have excellent visibility because you have this, this uh, glass uh, uh, roof uh, above you here. You have to look through these hedges. Yeah, yeah well, there's one more qu uh, picture here, I think. No, okay. Um, and, and what's the purpose? Well, this is actually a project that was launched uh, some years ago. There was a, this is Perlin 2, there was a Perlin 1. And uh, uh, those of you who follow aviation certainly still remember Steve Fawcett, right? Steve Fawcett was a guy who broke uh, uh, a high number of, of records. He was doing all kind of stuff, ballooning and um, and finally crashed on, on Darren Hilton's flying M range uh, some years ago. But he went up with a, with a, with a co pilot, um, can't remember which year it was, uh, but uh, up to 51,000 feet. Problem was, um, their cockpit wasn't pressurized, so their suits were getting very bulky to the point where they could not no longer um, no. You know, maneuver and uh, work on the controls. So they had to come, come down. Then that gave us the idea to Pressure develop rise. a pressurized um, Because a I think at 90,000 feet, the air is something like 2%? Of yeah, 2 or 3% of what it is at, at sea level. So very, very um, yeah, uh, low air, air density. Um, but it should be doable, these mountain waves in Argentina. The guys are deploying there in, in July, June, July. In, in August, September. But the idea was, I mean, we have been sponsoring uh, soaring for, for many, many years because think about it. I mean, that is the original form of flying, right? I mean, this is how it started. Lilienthal and other, other people um, did first fly without any, any propulsion. Also, because the, the, the guys um, who are manufacturing glider planes have always used, have always experimented with uh, lightweight material because you have no propulsion, you have to be as light as possible. At the same time, you need uh, structures that are as robust um, as, as possible. So they, um, lately, I mean, they have been leading uh, the carbon fiber. Before we were building larger carbon fiber structures in our commercial aircraft, military aircraft, uh, this was tried out and tested in, um, in, 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 in these um, glider planes. And uh, we'll use it also for some um, uh, small experiments up there uh, at the edge of the stratosphere. But one important thing is also we want to use this whole uh, Perlin project for inspirational purposes with, with young people to, uh, to inspire them to work in aviation in, in aerospace. And uh, I think we have a very good following with this project uh, around the world. So it has well, some, some purposes. One of the things that Dr. Sugar was going to ask is whether you were going to combine both your prowess at, at the controls here as well as skydiving from up there at 90,000 No, this, this, thing is, this thing is not good for skydiving. Actually, <laughs> actually, because you have to go in and out through these small hatches here. Yeah? Um, and actually, um, the pilots will not even have uh, um, Parachute. parachutes, but there will be emergency parachutes attached uh, to the aircraft, two. Um, so one at the, behind the cabin and the other one at the, at the tail in case of um, emergencies. No, this is, I, I'm, I'm trying to jump from a lot of aircraft, but um, <laughs> this, does not, this did not cross my mind, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> 
but but you you do still do that, and and so I want to talk uh, uh, with a couple of questions about leadership. So you're in an aeronautics business. Um, I mean, pilots are core to who you are. Do, and you talk about leading by example, walking the talk. Is is this just a manifestation of one of your precepts of leadership? One thing, I love to be with our test pilots. Our test pilots, test pilots, I think in, in every company, Ron, I mean, the aerospace company are a special, special breed of, of people. Uh, in our company, it's particularly important because they come from so many different nationalities. It doesn't matter a bit, I mean, which passport uh, you sport in this uh, brotherhood of, uh, of test pilots. And uh, they are, usually they are great leaders. I mean, one of our chief test pilots in the past, I would say was probably the best uh, motivational leader we had in the entire uh, company. But, but, but flying and test pilots incorporate very much the spirit of aviation still to the day. I mean, it has become very different from the, from the early days. Um, but um, so this is why I spend as much time as possible with our test pilots. Also, you hear stuff about your planes, particularly about new planes that sometimes do not get through the various management layers to, to the very top, to the, to the CEO. But um, it makes those people, the middle management and others, um, it, makes them, it keeps them honest if they know that the CEO also has a direct line to the test pilots and the people uh, in, the, in the factory. And I think that is, that is one element of um, leadership that is important in big companies. When, you're, when you have a company like ours, 135,000 employees, obviously you don't know everybody, but you need to be able to, to get through to those people who really have the experience, make the experience, and might not always be listened to by the various management echelons. So I'll ask you another leadership question because I found this very interesting about your background. You were co-president of EADS and, and you took what was, at least in terms of the typical organizational charts, a lesser role in being president of Airbus. I won't call it a demotion, but at least on the organizational chart it was a run down. And then five years later, you became uh, <coughs> a single president of Airbus. What, why did you do that? And what did you think of, about this move in terms of your career? And is there any relevance or can you paint a broader picture of that for our audience on how to think about it? The company had been highly politicized. Think about it. I mean, we were created in, in 2000. Um, what, what we did was we created a new company out of various national champions, particularly the French national champion, the German national champion, the Spanish national champion, plus uh, large parts of the, the, British, uh, the British industry. It was highly politicized. We had two CEOs, we had two chairmen, we had a completely balanced um, board, at least between the French and the Germans, because these are the, the two main constituent parts. You had flags behind every name so that you could see from afar, this is a German, this is a French, this is a German, this is a French. Um, and in 2007, time was ripe to, to stop this nonsense and to, to move away to, one ch to move to one chairman and one, one CEO. Uh, my co-chairman at the time uh, was Louis Galois, who was um, 14, 15 years uh, older than I, so it was a um, not so difficult decision for me. But the challenge was, I had been working in defense, leading the defense division for some years, um, but I've never worked in commercial aviation. And this was the ultimate challenge for me, also given the fact that Airbus Commercial is the largest part by far, 65% or more of the revenues. And uh, I wanted to prove that I could do it. And sure. you were in the midst of a crisis then? We were in the midst of a crisis. I mean, I, th I think at the time people did not think there was a high likelihood that I would survive this very long. Uh, I was the fifth CEO um, of Airbus Commercial in a little more than two years, so you can imagine there was quite a bit of a crisis. And you can also imagine how, how credible you are if you arrive there and tell people, but I'm, I'm gonna stay, people. I mean, and since <laughs> if I would lean back and say, oh yeah, two months, three months, maybe six months and stuff like that. Um, but I did this before. I don't wanna go into details in, in my career to, 
deliberately take a step back uh, in order to make a new experience. You're taking a bit of a gamble, yes, but, but um, I knew if I survived this, if I excelled in, in this job, that obviously I would be better prepared to lead the entire group uh, in the future. And I think, well, I to translate that into real life and business life, um, one should not be afraid to sometimes take a step back if one is convinced that this is a challenge that I, that I really want to, to tackle, I want to prove myself, and if I do it well, uh, I'm better qualified for other stuff uh, in the future. I think that's and, and of course, there was no guarantee, but 12, in 2012 you did uh, no. take the helm. Uh, I have lots more questions, but I think that uh, we want to engage our audience in, in asking questions. Maybe I'll ask one more and, and folks can line up in the meantime. Um, the, and this goes to some of the questions our students <coughs> are asking here. How you approach risk. I mean, obviously skydiving is not the same as walking <laughs> down the street, so personally you have a certain risk preference. How does that translate into um, your view in the company? And you talk about fail early, fail often as an approach towards innovation, but, but that requires a certain risk tolerance yeah. in, in the company. That is right. I mean, fail off, fail often, fail, fail fast, etc., is not something that is mainstream Airbus. Uh, I have to admit that. I mean, we are trying to experiment with this around the edges with, for instance, our new innovation center that we put up in um, San Jose, in the valley, uh, last, last year. Um, that is a big company, of course, uh, and uh, being responsible to a lot of, to a lot of shareholders. Um, you, you cannot be reckless about risks. So we have all today in industry elaborate risk uh, management um, uh, systems. Um, they are audited and, you know, this is all becoming very, very um, complex, but um, this only works if the people who use these risk management systems are really convinced that they are of operational use. I think uh, we've seen that in my company and other companies. Uh, uh, at, at, at first glance or superficially looked at it, uh, state-of-the-art risk management system. But if those are not really in, in operation, are used by the operational people in the running programs, etc. And if they use it just as an adjunct, oh yeah, we need to do this, we need to fill this out because corporate wants us to. Well, that's a, that's a risk management approach that fails. And that is sometimes uh, difficult. So the best risk management is what is developed out of the experience of people bottom up in the, um, in the operations. And that starts literally at the, at the shop floor level with uh, listening to the blue collars who have a lot to say about the risks are, the not the risks are. And the most, um, the most um, well, the approach one should not follow is to force it top down, uh, down the throats of people because this usually doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And more risks, yes, but um, again, um, in a, in a relatively controlled environment. I mean, we are taking huge risks in our industry uh, when we develop entirely new aircraft programs, military or, or commercial. As I say, sometimes we, we kind of bet, bet the company sometimes, right? I mean, when you, when you talk about a new program of 15 to 20, 20 billion euros or, or dollars, uh, gee, uh, that can burden your company for, for many years. So you better, um, you better get this right. Um, hence, new methods that can help us. Uh, my talk in the company is uh, we need to get faster, we need to get bolder, but at the same time we need to get much better in execution. And this is where digital tools and processes, I believe, can help us a lot in, in the future. Please introduce yourself and ask a question. Good afternoon, Dean. Good afternoon, Tom. Thank you, Tom, for coming and sharing your experiences with us today. My name is Sarmad. I work at BE Aerospace. We are part of a supply chain for Airbus. Uh, we provide the cabin interior products like galley inserts and such. 
So when I told the director of marketing at our company that Tom Enders is coming to UCLA, and if you have any questions for him, let me know, <laughs> he asked me to check with you what your strategy would be with potential competition from China. Any manufacturing, you, you mentioned already that you're manufacturing in China already, but there are other aircraft manufacturers up and coming. How do you plan to deal with future competition in China? Thank you. I thought it was a cabin and galley related uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> because we, are cur we currently have uh, a lot of challenges with cabin and galley, but not so much with you guys, as, as, you, as you well know. <laughs> so I'm happy you, 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 you come saved with you. the China question. You were question. saved yeah. from that no, question. No, but, but, uh, no, cabin, I mean, uh, cabin suppliers, and just, just one word here, are very, very important for us because how do airlines differentiate their product? It's not that passengers care that much about this type of Airbus or that type of Boeing, etc. Important as it is that these aircraft are. It's when are, you put your luggage and how it's. Yeah, and, and how high it is and yes. uh, how wide the seats are and, and so on. Right. And, and, and that is, uh, that is important. China. Um, yes, I mean, if I have to take one bet, but I think that's, that's an easy bet today uh, about the. Um, a competitor, more, more, more to say from the conventional side that will come up, it is uh, the Chinese. The Chinese are developing a aircraft comparable to our 320 or Boeing 737 right now, the C919. Of course, they have also some experience, some delays in their schedule. It would, have been, would be absolutely frightening if these guys were exactly on their, on their plan because that hardly ever happens with Airbus and Boeing, right, and, and, and the others. <laughs> so thank God they also uh, um, seem to be only human. Um, uh, they, they have some delays, but there's no doubt that the Chinese uh, will eventually master the art of building large commercial aircraft this size, and then I think they have already follow-on ambitions at least for, for larger aircraft. The, the question will be, um, how will the Chinese behave? How will um, the access to the Chinese market look like if they can build their own aircraft? Will the market stay open? Uh, or will they close it more or less because they do no longer need foreign aircraft? They can produce them uh, themselves. That is a good question. And then, how are these aircraft marketed? You know, we and Boeing are are feuding over, over years about who gets more government support, you, no you, and the only guys that are benefiting from that are the lawyers who, you know, uh, make, make a lot of money out of that. Um, but um, if you look at experience with other industries that the Chinese have, um, have come, come up and uh, are now very, very competitive, trains, for instance, um, the issue is not so much the new technology, but the question is uh, the wrappings around, the financial wrappings. Now, will they come up with a very, very competitive financial offer that will tempt airlines then uh, into buying this? And could that, uh, could that trigger kind of a new um, price or, or uh, a subsidy war between Western manufacturers and Chinese manufacturers? Our idea when we decided already in 2005 we need to be in China, produce in China, have Chinese suppliers, etc., engineering center, a delivery center, a final assembly line, uh, and partners was to say, look, we want to be also a player in the Chinese market. So we're taking a bet here that the Chinese market will not close down and that, yes, there will be Chinese um, manufacturers as well. But this market is so huge, I mean, for, for, for all of us, and the, the tendency, this market is not saturated any time soon that I think even if there's another uh, player in this market, and even if this player is particularly supported politically and else, um, uh, this is still the right strategy. Thank you. And next question. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Anders. Uh, I'm Ruchi. I'm a student of the Master's in uh, Financial Engineering program here. Uh, my question is about the impact of declining oil prices on the aircraft business. Uh, where I'm coming from is the fact that uh, lower oil prices are probably making it more economical to run the older, lesser efficient uh, aircrafts. 
So in that context, do you see the demand tapering down because of uh, low oil prices? And is energy efficiency still as high up on your agenda as it was when uh, oil was trading at $100 a barrel? Mm -hmm. and, Thank you. And, and adding to your question is, of course, the Mideastern demand because of declining economies there. Yeah, that's a very, it's a very good question. A question, as you can imagine, we, that we have also discussed amongst ourselves with our board, etc. What's, what's, uh, what's the effect? Well, first of all, we are not cutting back on our targets to build more uh, fuel efficient um, and less emitting uh, aircraft, that is for sure. Secondly, I'm absolutely convinced that also passengers um, are increasingly <laughs> environmentally um, uh, uh, concerned. Um, they, um, they look increasingly also at which aircraft are uh, emitting what. I mean, old aircraft, well known, are much more um, uh, emitting in terms of uh, not only noise, but, but, but uh, um, NOx and uh, CO2, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not, we're not cutting back on that. We have very um, ambitious targets uh, in, in Europe and through the I, ICAO. Um, secondly, we have not noticed that uh, airlines, and we would have noticed it, come to us and cancel uh, new aircraft that they had ordered and said, no, no, I don't need them anymore. I want to uh, fly my own, my, my old gas gaslers because that's, that's good enough at the oil price of below 50, uh, let's say. Uh, so there's no indication, cancellation of aircraft is a, a very strong indi indicator in the industry that something is happening, right? Um, and uh, the Middle East, um, yes, I mean, some of these airlines, I think, have budget problems because their, their, their governments have, have budget problems, but the strong ones seem to, seem to go forward. We will see what the order intake is this year. I mean, we had incredible years behind us. Just last year, again, we had an, an order intake of 1,400 aircraft. Imagine that. And, and you know, Boeing and us, basically more or less the same over the last uh, five years or so. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot sustain that at a production rate of s between 600 and 700 aircraft. So we are assuming that new orders will come down. But then again, with the huge order backlog, even if we had no orders for a couple of years, we would still have a lot of aircraft uh, to deliver. That is not so much a problem. But overall, we think that the lower oil price for the airline industry, for the commercial airline industry, is beneficial. Look at their profit statements uh, for, for 2015, 14, and, and then 15 particularly. Um, and uh, financially healthy airlines, financially healthy customers, uh, are customers that I much prefer over, uh, let's say, the normal airline that is hardly uh, break even and uh, has, uh, has, has a lot of problems of getting proper financing. So Let it's good. It's bad, by the way, for our helicopter business. They're Helicopter business, where you have a lot of oil and gas activity, offshore activity, etc. Uh, some of these offshore companies are going are going bankrupt. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately, the helicopter business and our group is a much smaller business than the commercial aircraft business. And, and let me ask a correlated question, uh, which has also come up here in the in the twit in the tweeting that's going on, and that is alternative energy ever any renewables that you see as part of your R&D in fueling yeah. oh, aircraft? Yeah. And, and, and maybe in this context, talk about your Silicon Valley R&D center. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, we have been, we've been engaging in, in R&D for um, uh, new fuel for, for quite some years. Uh, we do various projects with airlines and, of course, the engine manufacturers, for instance, for fuel based on algae. Uh, kind of synthetic fuel. Uh, most importantly is certainly our electric aircraft project. I, I would claim that we are world leading as far as uh, electric aircraft is concerned. We have now a clear project where, and the main partner, which is Siemens, um, where we both um, put uh, serious money in, i.e. both a triple digit million amount of money over the next five years or so to, to bring electrical propulsion for aircraft forward. And, and you see that being a, 
we think not limited by range issues. Well, we think that uh, within the next 15 years we should be able to have uh, build aircraft as let's say 90 seaters, 100 seaters, not 500 seaters uh, like A380s, um, which uh, propelled by electrical. Um, by electrics or hybrid aircraft, i.e. an aircraft that, that mm -hmm. starts and lands electrically and in cruise uses still uh, fuel, fossil fuel or fuel based on algae, by the way, which would open um, different, different business or additional business because uh, the, the, all the airport restrictions uh, throughout nights might be lifted because if you have electrical yeah. aircraft, the noise will be Will be in so we're putting a lot of emphasis on the electrical aircraft because we think it's, it's worthwhile. Um, I stop here because there are many other things. Okay, one more question and then I'll have one more. My name is Henry Bornstein. I'm a retired senior VP from Honeywell Aerospace, which is one of your larger suppliers. Yeah. I've got a long-term relationship with UCLA. I got my MBA here before it was the Anderson School. So I want to thank UCLA for hosting this conference. Uh, also, Dr. Sugar and I were on the Industrial Advisory Board together for the School of Engineering at UCLA. Mm -hmm. So, that being said, I have a, a follow-up question about China. Uh, we at Honeywell protected our technology vigorously. Uh, and we were very concerned about technology transfer, not only to our customers, both government and commercial, but even more importantly, to China. And you said you're, uh, you've got a, a manufacturing facility in China uh, building A320 aircraft. I assume it's the final assembly. Were you concerned about technology transfer to a major competitor? And if so, how did you control not only your own assembly and system integration technology, <coughs> but also the supply basis technology? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, yes, uh, we were concerned and we are concerned. And we've taken um, all measures that we found appropriate to uh, protect uh, our technology. Um, final assembly is not necessarily the most uh, sensitive area. Um, areas like engineering, areas like uh, certification of an aircraft, um, the whole flight testing, etc., are more sensitive in our in our uh, judgment, and these are areas that we have that we have particularly protected uh, outside the the necessary joint venture that we had to create in uh, uh, in China. But let me say, um, there's no form of cooperation that excludes the risk of leakage of knowledge or, or technology. And I would say even if we and our competitors vis-a-vis -vis China had taken, um, had taken the, the position that we do not want to do anything in China, that we don't want to have Chinese suppliers, that we don't want to encourage our suppliers to go to China, etc. I think uh, in terms of um, technology um, uh, progress in China, maybe that would have delayed this by five years or so. I think the genie is out of a bottle, let's face it. We have hundreds, hundred thousands of Chinese aerospace engineering students all over the world. By the way, I, I guess the bulk uh, in, the United, in the United States. Um, so even if you, you apply the, the strictest standards, I don't think you could, you could uh, avoid competition from China. And would, would, would that be fair? to say Chinese uh, should not build uh, aircraft. I think the only way out is to be leading in innovation and, and not stop with the technology that we have today. And that is what, what we at Airbus are, if anything, uh, we focus more on that, leading in innovation and uh, stay, ahead of a, stay ahead of a competition. But again, I mean, China is a, is a, is a great country. I always say people that can bring astronauts up into space and more importantly back again healthy <laughs> um, can certainly one day manufacture a very good commercial aircraft as well. Thank you. Um, last question and we'll be brief because students have to get to class. We talk about three pillars uh, in, in our 
character profile of, of, of UCLA Anderson alumni and students. They share success, they think fearlessly, and they drive change. That's when we look at the generations of Anderson alumni. Share success, think fearlessly, and drive change. Do those qualities resonate with you, with your culture at Airbus? Well, ab absolutely. I think we're, we're trying to build this as well. Uh, even for, I have for, for, my, for my managers and leaders, I'm more back to the, uh, to the old, uh, old fashioned military uh, character, competence, and courage as the, the other three pillars that, that I think are very important for, for any form of leadership. And I think that is, that is kind of uh, timeless. Um, fearless is very important. I was discussing um, in, um, in, in, in Mountain View, you can imagine who it was, uh, a couple of days ago, um, how to incentivize people to stop projects. One of the, one of the problems in, in, I guess, not only aerospace industry is uh, if you start an exciting project and you find out that it doesn't lead you, particularly in the R and you know R and T phase, it doesn't lead you to where you want to drive it, to give it up, because people very often feel uh, that they they have failed, that they are losers, and they stigmatized your project, and so people stick to that, and and all too all too often it happens that we don't terminate projects fast enough, and so the incentive, talking about fearless. To, um, to turn this around and say those people who are courageous enough to stop their projects because they, they see that it doesn't lead to the objective that you're driving at. Um, that is something that, that some of the Silicon Valley companies have in their culture. It's something we don't have yet at Airbus, I have to admit. But I think that's, that's a thing that is very important in this, in this new phase where we want to drive many more innovative projects and inevitably uh, some of them, or probably most of them, will not lead to the target, but to stop this and to incentivize people for failing, quote, unquote, right. is something it's not a mark relatively failure. new. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I know because you have uh, a Silicon Valley uh, uh, um, base, <laughs> we, we wanted to give you a hoodie oh, that you can you. wear <laughs> in Silicon Valley. It seems like it's the appropriate thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.